Well, he was a, a very nice grown up. Uh, growing up, we didn't have a lot, but you didn't know that you needed it until you got grown. You didn't have a whole lot of uh, things. And my mother worked hard to give us stuff, but you didn't know until you got grown. I always said we were popo, and you didn't know you were popo. Uh, my mother and them instilled education, going to school, and do your best. And that's where it was in the community. And we were very active in the church when a lot of children not active like they used to be. You went to Booker T. Washington Center or the church. You didn't have a whole lot of activities and computers and things like the kids have today. And if they do more reading and things, we would have better youth and they won't get in trouble in the community if they uh, stay into the books and try to get more education. And that's where I still in my grandchildren, and my son. But Pleasant Hill, when I grew up, was where the doctors, teachers, preachers, it was the first, quote, quote, middle class, upper echelon business people type things. Because a lot of businesses that were downtown that were owned by people that were from Pleasant Hill. I only want to get to start naming it. At one time, President Hill had a couple of hospitals. One was the Monday Hospital, and the other one was the hospital, um, I can't think of the name of it now, but it was up on uh, Madison Street, up near Tatnall Street. But uh, they, had to, and they had dentists that lived up, up, all up and down that road. And there were times, during Christmas time, when I was young, my mother and them would come over in this area, and we would always go to certain people's houses that she knew. They were all schoolmates and teachers, school teachers, friends of hers. And they always had these beautiful Christmas decorations and houses look so gorgeous in the yards. And I remember Miss Cleopatra Love had this backyard. She gave these little um, girl parties and doll parties. And Miss McKay had all this good ice cream. I, don't, I think it was homemade because I had never tasted ice cream to come out the store that it was this good. And uh, another one I always remember was coming over in uh, Pleasant Hill and hanging out with some of the guys up on top of the hill. And we were going to Anderson's store around the corner here. And he must have knew my mother or something. Because I always tell him I wanted to get five, was I wanted to get 10 cents worth of uh, candy. And he said, your bird song? I said, yeah, it's me. Bird song. Yeah, I thought that was your mother I was talking to the other week. Here, 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 take this bag. It'd be a bag full of candy. If you notice, I have no teeth now. So that might have been the start of this whole thing of no teeth. <laughs> Kids do not eat candy, please. <laughs> Too much. But I learned all that in Pleasant Hill. And it was, it was a joy coming from Tender Heights to come over in Pleasant Hill. L-I-N-W-O-O-D, Linwood Avenue, and from Allen Chapel Church, why, Pursley Street. And from L.H. Williams School up to Hardeman Avenue was North Street. And I told you about the little alley there when you turn off and go up second, go up and turn left there behind Harmony Church. That little alley that goes through there, you'll see North Street Lane in there now. Okay, I'm Dr. Thomas Duvall. I was literally born in Pleasant Hill at the old St. Luke Hospital. Uh, St. Luke Hospital was a, what we called in the day, a colored hospital located on Monroe Street. The physician that delivered me was Dr. J.S. Williams. The interesting thing was he was also a civil rights leader and I should say fighter back in the 1940s uh, uh, and well I won't say 40s but let's say 50s. But I went to L.H. Williams School. Uh, I lived mainly on Middle Street 
in Pleasant Hill. And later on, when my grandfather passed, I stayed with my grandmother around the corner on 3rd Avenue. So I literally was walking <laughs> up 2nd Avenue to L.H. Williams School, or I would actually detour uh, and stop by my grandmother's house to get what I call my second breakfast because my mother was in school at that time when I was small going to uh, Fort Valley State. And so she would be in a rush catch catching her ride and <clears throat> I'd get cereal <laughs> from my mother's, from our house at home, on Middle Street and then I'd stop by grandmother's house and she would have all these wonderful things. I didn't know him personally, I knew of him. Uh, a whole lot of the entertainers, I didn't know them personally. Uh, Otis Redding, uh, my family had done work for them in terms of upholstering, so we did know the Reddings. My dad uh, 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 knew Otis, yeah, uh, and so forth, because he had done you know, work for him and so forth. Um, uh, but I didn't, I, didn't know, uh, I didn't know little Richard personally. I moved over there in 81. I was in East Macon before then. Yeah. But I was on Fifth Avenue and Woodley Street when I was born. And that's where Little Richard lived, and on Fifth Avenue. And he didn't mention, Mr. Duval didn't mention Willie Mathis' store. I lived at two houses behind where the projects is on, on Monroe Street. And that was the rich folks, the Duvals and the Mathis and the Hutchins. He's my second cousin. His daddy and my grandmother, my grandmother was Georgia Penniman Dawson William. His daddy and my grandma was brothers and sisters. And my grandma was the oldest. She was like the major out of the family. Everybody looked up to Aunt Georgia. They called her Aunt Georgia. The Beatles always talked about if it wasn't for Little Richard, we would not be the Beatles. Back in that day, in the South, to have these little kids on this TV show, the next thing you know, they're called the Beatles and they come into America. And they're now singing songs and putting the richest flavor of the song into the song. Because this is what they had learned. And people like Eric Clapton and, and musicians like that, when you meet them over there, oh, you're from Macon, Georgia. How far did you live from Little Richard? And, you know, things like that. I said, oh, not far. I said, Macon is very small. When it comes to that, they said, but the streets must be paved with gold. I said, no, it's paved with musicians. You have to drink the water, you become a musician. I was telling them that. I heard, heard that years ago. I just started telling people that. Well, as a little girl, when I was uh, in the third or fourth grade, we didn't have a TV. So Lou Richard then was the only one who had a TV, and I lived on Fifth Avenue, about five doors from St. Mary Baptist Church. And I walked to his house to watch TV. And at that time, it was the edge of night and such for tomorrow. They only stayed on 15 minutes. We would walk to their house and watch TV. And they had the piano and the TV in the living room. You often call it the living room. And it was in this room here. <laughs> Looked like it was against the wall. I don't remember what the TV was, but the piano and the TV, that's the only thing I can remember. We, uh, everybody didn't have a TV at that time. I think I was in eighth grade before we got a TV, black and white. You just went to the neighbor house and watched TV. It was Channel 13 with the black cat on there. <laughs> but I can remember when he was a teenager and I was a little girl on Woodley Street, they would go up and down the neighborhood with uh, rub bowls. I don't know where you know what a rub bowl when you wash and make music and sing in the neighborhood. That's before he became a celebrity. I, I can remember that, them going up and down the street on Woodley Street singing. I think this is a golden opportunity. Uh, I hope this house will be used to teach our children about the entertainment world, but I hope that it will also be used to teach them about the rich history of Macon, Middle Georgia. Uh, the sad thing about our town is we have kids that, that have this idea that they're going to go somewhere else and everything is wonderful, because I was one of them. 
When I left Macon, Georgia, and I went up to Lincoln University and got to Philadelphia, I was appalled. Because, see, what I had been told was everything was wonderful in the North, because this was the era of segregation. It wasn't wonderful in the North. Well, I think it's lovely, it's nice, it's going to be a nice resource center, because he always honored Macon, Georgia. Whenever he come home, whenever he went anywhere, he always said that he was from Macon, Georgia, Little Richard Macon, Georgia. And it was a joy to have a cousin as a celebrity, but we always called him Richard. I always called him Richard. <laughs> he always liked to know what's going on in the community. So I'm just like the re uh, resource person to keep him you know, up to date on what's going on. It would help the community a lot because, see, I, I got photo album. I started in 1990. I do scrapping. So everything come in the newspaper, whatever, I got it in my scrapbook. So that will be a resource and encourage other children to uh, be a celebrity, be doctors or lawyers or whatever. That will be a good thing for the community because normally we don't have anything in the community like this. There was a band playing in front of us called Jimi Hendrix. I had never seen Jimi Hendrix live to know who he was. But after I saw him, I said, wait a minute, I seen that guy. The richest man in Macon. And then I said, I, I said I'm from Macon, Georgia. And the first thing that came out of his mouth was, yeah, you're going to tell me about Johnny Jenkins. And I said, that's Johnny Jenkins style all over again. I'm looking at this thing. We was in the, was class, his name is Clarence Riley. We was in the audience before we got ready to go on. I'm looking at this guy. He's doing everything I said. Man, that guy remind me of Johnny Jenkins doing all that stuff. That's what Johnny used to do. And I'd be darned if it wasn't exactly that. And he said, he didn't say he knew Johnny anything. He said, I know all about Macon and Sawyer's Lake. I said, uh-huh. For him to know about Sawyer's Lake, he had to have been in Macon. Then I found out he had family and stuff around here. And that explains some of him being with Little Richard and everything. But being with Little Richard, there were no two stars on the same show. He was uh, real cordial about it. And so we you know, so he got to be friendly. So I didn't see, I never did see him again. And we, tra we traveled to different circuits because he went, one direction, he went to England or somewhere like that. And then our thing was mostly a soul act. His thing was a rock act. And so we didn't actually run across each other again. But that taught me a lot about the connections that you make on the road and people you see. You have to remember, when you're growing up, you might see somebody. Now you might see them at a different level when you're on the road again. I, I thought about things like that, and it was, it was a wonderful thing for me to just be out there. And I stayed out there 15 years traveling with Sam and Dave, and you got a chance to travel all over the place doing all kinds of stuff. It was just it was wonderful. Did I do it all over again? Yes. In a heartbeat, I would do it again. You know, he's special by him being a celebrity but uh, and someone to look up to. But he always mentioned Macon as his home. He have always uh, honored being a born and raised in Macon, Georgia. My message is African-American ancestral obligation to learn. That is how we will make Macon, Georgia the blessed community that we all know it can be. Teach these children they have an ancestral obligation to learn based on the history of their forebearers, of all the hardships they went through to give them the opportunity for a free public school education. You can't sit around and waste your time when you know your ancestral obligation. That's what we have to teach our kids. That's what I think. I would like to see all the people that do see this documentary, buy it, store it, share it, and make sure all of your kids see it, even down to the grandkids, and let them know that you have seen one of the best artists in the world, the number one. The only one, Little Richard.
He's a basically started this whole thing called rock and roll. Ask any of those English people and many of the millions of people in America that have bought his music. What do they think? If they didn't like him, they would have never bought the music. And he is.